We are excited to talk about the transition to parenthood. Uh, I'm Marielle Benjamin. I am joined by Dr. Erin O'Connor, who's on this side of me. I'm doing the Vanna, <laughs> the Vanna situation as if you're a alphabet tile over here. We are from Cooper. I was going to say we are Cooper. Um, for those of you who do not know about Cooper, we are a new parenting community where we run small parent monthly groups where we talk about child development and everything we know from the research and make it really practical and help solve urgent questions you have and talk about the long-term trajectories of raising children. And we do all kinds of other amazing support like these assemblies where we sometimes bring in speakers, sometimes talk about a topic ourselves that we're really passionate about. We've got office hours for every question you ever needed to answer right away and all kinds of other uh, recorded and live events on our platform. So if you don't know a lot about Cooper, we're really excited that you're here and we hope we can introduce you to all the many wonderful things that we do. And if you like this, please come to more assemblies and events and consider joining a Coop group where actually Chloe, who's on camera too, who's another facilitator between Aaron, Chloe and myself, you will get to see one of our faces. And if there's one of our faces you don't like particularly, you can have the other two faces for <laughs> um, for groups. And we would we would love to have you. So that's our intro. And we are all parents. We all have transitioned to parenting. I don't think I'm used to the I don't think I'm on the other side of the transition. I don't know, Erin, if you think you're on the other side of the transition. I do not at all, actually. I spent a lot of today thinking, like, when is the transition going to feel right? And I have a almost 15-year-old, and it's still, I'm still in the process. It's really, it's a little discouraging. But, you know, so tonight we're going to talk about some of the changes, psychological, physiological, and emotional, um, about the transition, and a lot of the research about all of the ridiculous and amazing things that are happening to you as you uh, transition to becoming a parent for the first time, and then also just riding the wave of, of parenting. So Erin, you want to kick us off with a little bit of background on things? And we're going to trade off, guys, and we're going to talk about the research, and then we're going to get into questions. We asked our um, followers for some questions, and we have some really good, rich ones that are tough to answer. So that'll be fun. Sure. So thanks everyone for being here, <laughs> despite our FAA technical issues. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, so I'm a researcher sort of, you know, in my, in my other life um, and Marielle more practitioner. So we're sort of tag teaming on, on everything, not just this assembly, but everything Cooper related. Uh, so, you know, just, I feel comfort in knowing sometimes that the research supports what I am feeling as a parent, as a mom, um, as a professional. So, you know, I think what's a nice kickoff for our questions tonight, and we also would welcome anyone to ask questions in the moment, in the chat, because uh, we want this to be more of a conversation than Mariel and I have the luxury of talking to each other all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> we would love other voices in this conversation, but you know, when I became a parent for the first time, which was almost 15 years ago, and then for the second time, almost three years ago, that transition to me was, you know, life-changing, which I'm sure it is for all of you as well. And I was a researcher in parenting way before I became a parent. And, you know, I thought I sort of had all the answers, but I think, you know, there's a lot to begin by research and knowing the research. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that and then delve into more sort of the practical questions that come up. But when we think about what sort of the literature and the research tells us about this transition to parenthood, we really think about sort of four buckets. Um, there's the neurological change, there's the hormonal change, there's the identity change and the family dynamic and psychological change. So sort of, you know, a brief little snippet on each of those buckets is that when we think about the neurological changes, really recent research in neuroscience is showing us how much changes in our brains, our partner's brains, as we go through this transition. And I, what's so fascinating to me is, as the mom through both biology and adoption is that we see this in parents, no matter what sort of the birth circumstances are. And that is that our brains become organized to really like care for these little 
beings that come into our lives. And, you know, before becoming a parent, our brain was very much focused right on our identity development, on our careers, on, on really our survival. And then once this other person enters into our life, that's very dependent on us, our brains become a little bit reorganized so that we can be the person that can provide for them. And I think what's so interesting about this is that there's this sort of myth out there about this transition to parenthood, that it's all blissful and it's all inborn. And we're going to have this just amazing bond with this child that comes into our life. And what we're learning from recent neuroscience research is that the brain is organized in such a way that maybe the emotions don't follow in the moment because a lot goes on, right? And to expect just bond instantly might not be fair. And biology has sort of made it so that we don't have to feel those emotions right away. So that our brain is organized so that we're focused on these two areas, one of them being the prefrontal cortex that really sort of allows us to just focus on this little being and provide for them. And the emotion, the instinct can come along a little later, which I think is very reassuring in a way because right it feels so good I really I think that when the science makes you feel good is like just like the best moment but that whole idea that you're going to have these instincts about what to do it just like it baffles me and as my kids continue to get older and as you said coming from like the we know this stuff we teach this stuff but the idea that you're going to have these instincts right away to do it, I think is so discouraging, especially to moms who feel like it's unnatural when they don't have them. But then when you have that research, like you said, that like crying irritates us so that we will meet our baby's needs, right? Like that makes total sense. Crying is hard to listen to so that you respond to a crying baby. Like on a primal level, you're like, oh, I really get this. It doesn't have to be about emotional connection at that stage. Totally. And I think only now we're sort of coming on board with all that in terms of like the science and that folks are really thinking, okay, you know, this, this, you know, historical myth of the bliss of parenthood is, it's not really borne out (laughs) when we actually look at what happens in terms of neurology, in terms of hormones, right? Like a lot of what allows us to sustain a pregnancy is actually like really hard when those hormone levels drop and we're on our own and we're crying about a turkey sandwich I I feel Mm -hmm. like that's when you're just like I there's no hope for whatever whatever is happening in this transition I can't possibly be in control of because I'm I'm literally crying over a turkey sandwich and so something has gone you know awry in this totally right and having done it both like both through birth and through adoption. Like I cried during a hot shower in both of those instances. (laughs) I love my hot shower. This is like what I've been longing for, but there's this hormonal neurological shift that goes from like completely being focused on the infant to, and then, oh my gosh, what happens to our ourselves, right? In that, in that shift. And there's a biological underpinning to that, which I think is comforting in a way because Knowing that doesn't feel like, oh my gosh, why am I having these feelings? I should be feeling blissful, but there's, there are many reasons why it's okay to not feel blissful. (laughs) Yeah. And having that information can, I think what we hope that everybody takes away tonight is also like, what do you do with this? And this is a perfect, just like, well, what do you do with this? You forgive yourself, you change your expectations and demands of yourself in in all periods of parenting, but especially in the early transition. And, you know, you you don't feel guilt and shame and some of those other things we're going to get into in this talk about things that have a really good scientific explanation, right? So that if it's only that takeaway, I think that's a really important practical piece of this is that understanding it can just make, have you make sense to yourself and also to other people around you in a different way. So important. You know, uh, somebody said to me, you have to give your gr- yourself grace in parenting. Mm-hmm. And I think like, this is a perfect example of why you need to give yourself grace in parenting. Yeah. That is a whole shift for us. Right. And yeah. sometimes it, I feel like it's forgotten. I, I completely agree. Completely agree. 
And that's why it can lead to those other things like the isolation and the loneliness and the guilt and all of the, uh, the rest of it, because I feel like we don't ever spend enough time talking about that change and that shift. And when we think of things like identity, you know, we have really powerful evidence that if you've been mostly focused on yourself, which is totally appropriate <laughs> before you had somebody you necessarily had to like live and die for, right? Um, not that we didn't love many people and animals before this, but in a different way with your children, um, you know, when you have that, it just really changes what self-care looks like. I don't know about you, but like we have a lot of research that self-care, we are not talking about manicures and going to get your hair done. Like we're just basic, meeting your own basic needs in a way that makes you full enough to be present for others. And moms don't do that. And the transition for parenting to parenthood, I feel like goes from a full tank that's relatively full, like we're busy and we're crazy, but we do a lot of work to keep it full to just a giant drop in like, we are very last on the list for everything. And that really affects us. Totally. And, you know, it was interesting. Like I was talking to somebody earlier today and they were saying like, your most important role as a parent is to be there and to be a healthy parent. Yes. And a lot of what happens during that shift, if you don't feel supported is that you're not necessarily at your healthiest, right? Psychologically, even physically, right? We're talking about all these physical changes, but yeah. You know, the psychological shift as well is so big. Like we think about identity and we think about who we were before having a child and after a child and some of the things that defined us the most, right? Like our ethnic identity, our religious identity, they take on a different significance and meaning once we're a parent. So it's yeah. all these things coming together at once, um, which sometimes at least I feel are not acknowledged enough, right? Because we have this narrative of how it's supposed to be this life-changing, which it is, event in a way that makes everything perfect. <laughs> you right. know, it can really be positive. Exactly. I remember, and I hope this will resonate with people, but I distinctly remember holding my first child when she was a baby and walking by a mirror when we were out of the house and seeing myself holding a baby and having this very strange moment where I like did not recognize myself. Like it wasn't the way I was imagining myself in my mind because for so long that had obviously not been the case. And then all of a sudden it's like, which baby am I holding? And then it's like, wait, I'm your, oh, oh, right? Like what, how you think about yourself in that way. And we've got so much data that women uniquely experience that shift in their entire identity in a way that I feel like still in our society, not everybody has to take on, but as women, we take on, you know, more profoundly in a, in a mother role. Totally. And, you know, the research would even bear that out, right? That no matter what choice you make or can make or can't make in terms of going back to work, not going back to work, there's so much guilt associated with it for both genders, but probably more for women, right? Just because of sort of the historical <laughs> path and that it's, you're not providing enough. Oh my gosh, I'm at home enough. Like there's never that sense of ease and calm, right? Yeah. That a lot of us felt before, like you made, made the decision, you're happy with your career, you're happy with various decisions you've made, but now it takes on a whole complexity based on a lot of societal pressures that, you didn't have before. And that adds so much in terms of parenting stress and guilt and anxiety and loneliness. Yeah. And you, you always talk about the research that like a, a mom who feels good about her decisions is more valuable to a child than the actual impact of those decisions. Right. So like if you are happy with what you've chosen to do for childcare or for work or whatever it is, that is actually more important to your relationship then which, which path you actually chose. And I think that's incredible research. I totally agree. And that, that was one of the things that kind of drove me <laughs> to this path was in grad school. My advisor was doing this large scale study of women across the United States and looking at, you know, what was sort of that quote unquote secret sauce that made for, you know, a happy mom and a, a good relationship with their child. And at the time, cause this was few years ago, because I'm slightly older, it was like, oh my gosh, childcare is going to be really bad for kids. And it was like, no, that's not what they found 
at all. It was all about how confident the mom was and about the choices that she made, because that impacts how sensitive and responsive you are with your child in those. And it can be like 20 minutes a day that you have with them, but it's like the amount that you're in the moment, right. Yeah. That really creates that profound relationship that helps your child in terms of their long-term development. It's not whether you're there during the day, whether you work or you don't work, it's how confident you are in the decisions that you make and how sensitive you can be to them. Yeah. And I think it's amazing when you look at the the similarities across stay at home and working mothers in the ways they think they are failing their children, right? Specifically, because I know you and I really want to get into the mom guilt and shame stuff, but like in this transition period, we are all so hard on ourselves. Stay at home moms have so many other things going on in the household. There is so much work to be done that they don't feel like they have enough quality time with their kids. Working moms who just physically are there less feel like they don't have enough time. And it's that same, you know, something we talk about a lot that I don't think people talk about enough is like that, that expectation we have of ourselves that we are never enough, that we are like never measuring up. And we see that again in the research, in surveys of parents who mostly feel like they're not doing very well, which is such a sad sort of state of affairs. So sad. And who feel really lonely in the process, right? You know, I more than 50% of parents of young children feel really lonely. And that's very sad I, and indicative of sort of the pressures that are on all of us. It's like, we feel like nobody else is in this journey with us at times, but yet so many of us are feeling the same way. And it's like, why is there so much of this disconnect? And, you know, I think some of it is this lack of sense of community that we're all together in this, but that's just not sort of the narrative that's been built historically within our culture. And I know one of the things that we want to talk to everybody about is also just parenting stress. Like we are among the first generations to use parenting as a verb, right? It's like something you do. You, for a lot of us, our parents felt like their only obligation was to keep us alive, right? Like that was what parents did. And the rest happened to you and you played on your street and you went to school and like things were different. And then you go back even further than that. And you did have this idea of a village and people all participating in childcare in a different way. And we are among the first parents to think, mm, there's actually a right way or maybe a wrong way, or you can really mess them up, or you're going to go to therapy and blame your parents. I'm pretty sure like my parents were not worried about whether I was going to end up in therapy to blame them for anything at all. Right. And we're making those jokes in, you know, I spent many, many years over a decade working with moms in on the postpartum nursery after they had delivered. And they're already like, is she going to remember that I wasn't here? And it was like, oh my God, we're just so concerned. It's right. We've so this idea that parenting stress has infiltrated so much just as a society with the way we view ourselves. Um, and millennial parent surveys were sort of the first to tell us that millennial parents thought that it was really possible to do parenting as that verb again, like the wrong way. And one thing we want to make sure we say tonight is like, that's just not true. We just, we know it's not true and that there's a lot of different voices that confuse that message, but that there is still so much room in development. Development is so forgiving. Like our relationships are so forgiving and repair works actually better than just being perfect the first time, right? Which is not realistic. Um, and so that's a lot of that stress feels self-inflicted when we, when, when we have the science, we know we, we don't need to feel it all. Such a good point. When we, when we have the science, we know we don't have to feel it or that we can like create our children, right. In like this, this way, like, of course, being loving and responsive and providing for them is so important. But apart from that, there's so many things that go into who a person becomes or temperament, so many things, right? Environment, like yeah. this is why research is so muddy in this area, because there's so many factors that we know influence who a child becomes. Uh, but that said, there's also a lot of chatter out there about the perfect way to parent and the imperfect parent and it's almost like information overload right in in like the best sense yeah so i see this question from erica about 
I don't know what research specifically you're talk you you want to hear about for postpartum depression, anxiety, and psychosis because there's so much. Um, you know, I as a social worker talking about postpartum depression and anxiety a lot. You know, I think we we know that over 80% of women experience what we call the baby blues, right? Which is that more mild and yet it doesn't feel mild at all readjustment in hormones, specifically the birth mother after delivery, right? So in experiencing that, feeling the highs, lows, crying about a turkey sandwich, and then feeling fine two seconds later, we we know that that sort of trajectory is a couple of weeks of those feelings that should come and go. And when we see those feelings not going and staying more consistently, then we think of something like postpartum depression and anxiety. And I think two things are really important to say about that specifically. One is, of course, that it is so much more common than it is treated or talked about. And we definitely have the research to bear that out. But two is that treatment for the mother directly benefits the child. So we see greater, and so, oh, how long can it last? And can it be after a year or two? So untreated, if it's untreated, it can obviously last a long time because it, it, it even though it has a hormonal origin, it doesn't necessarily correct itself on its own. Um, I don't know about how long after delivery you would make a new diagnosis, but that's a great question that um, would probably ask a psychiatrist about that. I don't know, Erin, if you know that off the top of your head of how long outside of childbirth they would give you a new diagnosis. So I don't know about an, the diagnosis part of it. I do know in terms of like the research side of it, and that is that they do show for, for some folks, you know, a two to three year impact of the birth, you know, you know, in terms of hormones and, and, you know, neurological changes. So I'm not sure what the diagnosis would be. That's, you know, a psychiatrist field, but in terms of knowing like the biological impacts, you definitely can see them several years postpartum. For sure. And what, and I think what is really interesting and important is that the impact on the child is again, back to that idea when mom isn't well or isn't where she needs to be, that affects that relationship. And so we, we tend to think of depression in general as something like that's our problem and we should deal with and very separate from us as a parent. And all of the data says the opposite, right? A mom who can't form that secure attachment with her baby because she's preoccupied with thoughts of anxiety, that's disrupting that relationship that the baby needs. So I often will say to moms, like, if it's not about you, if it feels too selfish to make it about you and how you're feeling, make it about your child and about the fact that you doing that can help in that relationship, which is so important. And again, it's it's messed up that we, we do things for the sake of our children more than we would do them just because they're good for us. But again, that's where the research really can help us understand that, that it's not selfish in any way to need to go to therapy, to need to take medication, to need to take time out, to make sure you get enough sleep and eat well and do all of those other things that are really essential to your mood. Again, it's right, it totally comes back to like a healthy parent is the most important ingredient. And how we get to that point where we're a healthy parent, you know, I know for myself included, like it's it, sometimes it's like the therapy route, sometimes it's the medication route, and it can sometimes hit us not in that you know three month period when we think of like the true postpartum period. Um, I was actually reading a really interesting research study earlier where they tracked parents of children all the way through age twenty one, and they showed you know at different periods in a child's life, parents are more susceptible to feelings of depression whatever you want to call it, right? And maybe it's not postpartum when your child's a teen, but that's a period in your child's development and your development where you're more likely to experience periods of depression. Um, so I think, it, it, yeah, it's so important, right? To think of the whole trajectory of parenthood and there are always milestones where it might be harder at, at times. Yeah, for sure. And I love what you were saying before is you know, parents are one ingredient. So I think it's important, especially if you have a baby and this is the beginning of your journey to think about yourself, like almost to balance the two ideas at the same time, that your relationship is so important that if you do nothing else but 
love your baby and spend time building that attachment, that would be enough. Like really from a research standpoint, that would be enough. Like take away the bells and the whistles and the noise and that relationship is the single most important thing you could probably give to your child, right? Um, in a world consumed by things they, that we feel like we have to buy for our kids, but the, just the relationship. But pairing that with the relationship is just one part of that environment and who that child is and how they're gonna grow up. And so I always feel like it helps to think of like, you create the sort of like scenery, like you are the scenery around your child and you try to set them up with the best and whatever, but then all of the other things that enter the scene, you can't be responsible for. You can help adjust to all of those new factors, but you just can't feel like you can control all of them because it's not realistic. And then it's just too much pressure on the parent role. And I, I was thinking about one of our audience questions from our, our stories is, you know, thinking about if your child is really seems to be forming a strong attachment to their nanny or their grandparent and sort of that tug that we often feel as as moms or primary caregivers of what if my child is forming these other attachments and how does that make me feel? How is it for the child? And, you know, again, sort of thinking back to the research, multiple attachments is a great thing for your child. So, you know, if you're sort of having a difficult time and your child has an amazing babysitter and an amazing grandparent, co-partner, that's a wonderful thing. And allowing sort of those folks to be in your child's life and to help them, to help you, all, all the reasons, everything will say that's a good thing because more, is more. Exactly. And, you know, throughout life, we form multiple attachments, right? So from the beginning, if sort of you're developing these models of having close, loving relationships with multiple people, people, that's a great thing. So I I hope that takes some of the pressure off, or at least I'm thinking it does for me (laughs) Um, as a mom, right? That it's not as as important as we are. It's not all about us, like like you're totally. And it is, it is meant to relieve the pressure because like it, it can't be you. But that actually leads me to another really great question. We got a question from a dad saying, how can I work to support my wife? She's breastfeeding. Sometimes it feels like there's no room for me, right? In that early relationship or that she thinks I'm incompetent. So like, I felt like when I read that one, it really resonated because sometimes also we are clinging to that idea that it has to be us so much that we're actually like gatekeeping in a way that prevents other people from that relationship. Right. Like, I mean, and I, and I, I feel, I don't know if that dad is here, but I feel like that so acutely that it can feel like in that, in those early stages, like this is a two person dyad and I don't know where I belong. And breastfeeding definitely can contribute to that because like the person with the boobs is required, I guess, for for that session. But, you know, even to do things, I always tell dad, like you be the one who does diapers and you be the one who gets the baby dressed and you do bath time and all these other moments. And, you know, if you just did diapers, and you're gonna change 6,000 diapers in the first two years of life, that's a lot of time, right? And actually it's my favorite time when you're the perfect distance away from your baby. So, you know, when your baby can see like this distance and you are changing a diaper and right over their face and you're doing parent D's and you're doing all that beautiful talking, that is a relationship just like done in the bag. You know, who's doing the feeding and all those other stuff really doesn't, take away from anyone else, right? And so like finding those moments and for moms to also be, again, it really resonates that he sometimes feels incompetent because like that that can be how we make other people taking care of our children feel when we think we're the only one who knows how to do it. Totally. Why I mean, are we I, like that? Why do we have to be like that? <laughs> I think there's so much pressure on us though, right? Like if you read so many of the popular sort of press, blogs, whatever, um, there's, there's this idea that it's all on mom. And, you know, from a personal perspective, I felt like that was very negative for even knowing all the research and knowing all that. When I became a mom, I kind of felt like I was a little bit like the gatekeeper. Um, 
because you feel like it's all like if something goes wrong, it definitely feels like it's all on you in a way, right? As the primary person, whether that's mom or dad, but who whoever is like sort of the primary person, you're like, oh my gosh, if if something goes wrong, it's going to be my fault. So I have to control every variable I can. <laughs> I know. I love the idea of like splitting the responsibilities, though. You know, I'm real like I really feel like if you're starting solids, like that can be one person's thing, right? Or by the way, your nanny's thing or daycare, you leave it to daycare to figure out how to do these, some of these big transitions. Like I'm really in support of like, you don't have to care about every lane equally. Like I will give you a little bit older child example. Like I can't deal with scooters and bike riding. It's nothing about that feels like a moment I want to teach my children how to do these or I want to do them together. I have delegated that. That is like squarely my husband's role. I mean, he has many roles, but one of them is that like, those are things he enjoys with the kids that I don't need to get involved in. You know, when they were younger, it was like he had more patience for rocking at bedtime than I did. And I really wanted to do bath, right? And I think there's a lot of that division that can help to keep some of those tra- this transition you know positive for you that there is it does free up time to do something else but it also makes you feel like you you don't have the whole burden on your shoulders totally something then- that i do think a lot about just in terms of like my friendship network is when you're the only caregiver and like you're a single parent and it's all on you like how you figure out how to delegate or, or, you know, to others or to just find time to have your own mental space. And just thinking of when we don't have necessarily that support network, like what can we do to make ourselves more sane in that moment? Absolutely. And, you know, but you know what, sometimes I feel like some of sometimes single parents are better at accessing resources in that way because there's an acceptance. And sometimes it's it's even that mental acceptance of like, I am gonna need help or I'm gonna need support or I am gonna need someone else that can help drive some of that. But I, I totally agree with you. It's just like, how are we gonna find all these things? Especially in a world where some of them can be hard to find, right? We don't live in a society that supports moms from the beginning and has all of these childcare options and, and all of these kinds of things. And that's part of why we all felt really passionately in launching Cooper, because we also felt like there needs to be a place where parents can come together and learn together and talk together. And that is hard to find, especially one where you can tell the truth about your experience and learn about your experience and not just be judgy. Totally. And I think, you know, community has kind of shifted in how we think of community, right? There's so much virtual community now, which has so many benefits. And then thinking about when you can sort of tune out the virtual community that's not supporting you when you're like scrolling through Instagram and you're like, oh, I I, I don't have this picture perfect experience. Right. <laughs> and it makes you feel really bad. And it's okay to say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to engage with that. I, I just want to engage with what makes me feel good as a parent and gives me that strength to go on, whether it be as a single parent in a co-parenting situation, whatever that be. Yeah. Um, I think maybe we should do another question and then we should talk about some of the strategies that we, I mean, we've touched on a bunch of them. Um, One that I really like is how, I think we've sort of said that like, how much does one baby need from you? But how about when you have more than one? And the balance of like, the question is around, I feel like I've ruined my toddler's life by bringing home a new baby. It's a whole new world for me. And I feel like I don't have enough time for anyone. Such a good question. Such a good question. And again, the research on that is like, you. it's not about time. It's not like time on a clock and your availability and your love I mean, presumably is endless. I don't know. I, there must be a number, a max number of children that you could ever have together in, at the same time. But um, I don't know. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Like the balance of there is no balance. It's just is. It it just is, and I think you know. Again, going back to that, it's not all your time on one child that matters, or 
right? It's like the quality of the time that you have. And it can be 20 minutes a day. It can be 30 minutes a day, whatever, whatever that looks like where you're really attuned to one child, two children is what matters. And, you know, you said something actually weeks ago, when we were talking about a transition to one to two and you were like, you know, you never apologize, right? Like this is a positive thing for everyone involved. So never like, apologize or feel guilty for it and stick with routines. <laughs> and, but I think there's like, those are the two core things, right? That as long as your first doesn't feel or your second when the third arrives, whatever the number is completely like their world has changed and like mom, dad feel badly about that then they feel secure in the environment and they're maybe happy or maybe not happy, right with that transition, but they don't feel anxiety because things have like totally blown up and mom and dad feel bad and everything's different. Um, so I always go back to that when I think about like having more children, it's what you said. And yes. <laughs> well, it brings up routines, which I think is like one strategy we definitely want to talk about. If we could convince anybody to get a regular routine who doesn't have one, this is the pitch, right? Which is that like for your baby, for your child, we know that routines help them organize information that they're taking in all around them as they learn things. Repetitive patterns help them understand and anticipate what comes next. If my bedtime looks the same every night, I learn to anticipate bedtime and I'm more likely to go to sleep in an easier way when I like stop fighting against what's going to happen next and I just realize like it's bedtime it always looks like this right and so there are so many reasons that we could spend we do have an entire coop session on it but we could spend three hours talking about how important routines are but for moms for dads for caregivers you know I feel like routines are essential and I think that is really sort of played out when you look at like how a preschool runs, how a daycare center runs, like there is a schedule, there is a reason there is. And in the early weeks when you can't have a schedule and when you might be feeding on demand and you know, looking, the newborns are sleeping all the time, it can be hard, but then there's that shift. And I think that shift into like, I can plan my day and I can work with, anticipate what's coming next and know when I'm gonna get lonely and know the time of day that's hardest for me and know where I need help because that's where I start to get tired and cranky and all that can make a tremendous difference in how you manage this transition. And then I think as your child is aging, you're revising that routine, right? So like their naps are changing, your work schedule may be changing, your caregiving schedule may be changing and all of those things that are happening when you can anticipate them, when you can plan for them, really help. And we're just like, as humans, we're just conditioned to like that, like some guardrails around like what we think is gonna happen next. And it's, you know, I think it's one of the things that we have always taught adults with anxiety about the importance of doing that. And we don't talk about in the context of this transition to parenting as being this anxiety filled thing where some of those same techniques work. Right. Like, you know, even if you look sort of, you know, going back to the research, one of the things that's so jarring when you become a new parent is your routine is no longer right. Like probably, you know, a lot of whatever you got up, you went for a run, like all, all of that just in a moment is like, gone. <laughs> now you can't even drink your coffee while it was still hot. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> that, that shift from a routine to what feels like no routine is very jarring because right as humans, we kind of want to have some control yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden it feels like you have no control. Yeah. The other thing I think is important as a strategy is to change your expectations to almost welcome and accept that things aren't going to go the way you thought. So, you know, we have like, again, really good data around adults with anxiety, this idea of like, um, some of the meditation people call it the friendly visitor, your anxiety. Have you heard that one where it's the friendly visitor, right? And the, the idea is like, if you expect this thing shows up every once in a while, I don't know if friendly is how I would describe my anxiety. I was, anxiety. Thinking, I was just thinking that. I was like, I don't know. You know, the meditation world makes it sound nicer and it's a friendly visitor. But the idea is really like, if you expect that that visitor is going to show up, you open the door and you welcome that they're there and you don't have to engage with them. You just aren't shocked by the like 
I thought nobody was coming over today and here you are, which I think is like a really beautiful metaphor around the anxiety and the, the sort of upheaval that parenting is when we think we've got it all buttoned up and nothing is going to come our way. We're so disappointed when it happens. We're so angry and, and feel like such shame and guilt for ourselves instead of just being like, oh, I'm anxious. This, this is what happens to me. Bedtime makes me anxious. Here it is again. Totally. Right. And then it's, it's not, it's not going to mean that anxiety is going to go away, but we don't have to punish ourselves every time we feel it. And I think getting out of the house in the morning, dealing with the transition to work, fighting over naps, like whether you have a colicky baby, there are so many things that if you just say like, look, this is, this is hard for me. This is one of those moments where like, I get that not so friendly visitor and I feel really angry. I feel really sad. I feel really lonely, whatever that is. Maybe I don't have to beat myself up every time. Totally. And something that I had heard too, when I was a new parent and also the research was kind of, you know, support is that need to feel productive, right? So, you know, that like in the long trajectory of 21, 40, 50 years, like attending to your baby and be tense and responsive is so important, right? But in the moment, <laughs> you're yeah. not getting that feedback. <laughs> yeah. So put but even if it's just like a little thing in your day where you'll get some feedback, if it's like organizing, you know, one drawer in your closet, then yeah. you can just feel like you got something done. Right. Can okay. I- now your inbox. Exactly. <laughs> I, I do have a lot of, I think I have 40,000 unread messages in my inbox. So that would not be a task for me, but I feel like I'd have to change my email. If that was me, I'd have to just change my email and start again. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't have a plan to help manage that. That was a bad example. For me, it's like, if I clean it out, I feel something's been accomplished. Even if I didn't answer any of them, I like sorted it. I'm sure know. for many of you, the email does feel like that for, for me, not so much, yeah. but <laughs> Organizing like the underwear drawer, amazing. Uh, a productive day. <laughs> we have a but, good question in chat about how to teach your family about routines that are important to you if that's not something that's in their culture. I mean, either culture, culture, or just family culture, right? That's a really good one. Excellent one. And tough to answer. <laughs> so, so, I, so I'm very like, you know, think about the emotion around things. And so my first response was like, can you, if they're receptive to this, can you say, this is something that's very important to me. I totally understand if it's not something so important to you, but right now I'm really sort of feeling like I need to focus on what's important to me and my baby. And this specific part of the routine is really important to me. And this is why. So providing some context to why it's so important to you and your child to have that part of the routine is how I approached it, right? That's just like a a personal um, thing, but sort of putting it in context. So it's not like, you know, with like with my parents, when, when my first was really little, I didn't want her to have TV before bedtime, whatever. There's no research saying this, but, but I'm just, that was my thing. And at first they were like, well, no, like that's what comes her down. Like, that's what we're doing. (laughs) Okay. I'm kind of annoyed, but I'm going to try to take a few deep breaths and explain why that's not how I do things. And I'm not saying it totally changed the world, but I felt like it did sort of take it away from sort of that immediate, like, this is how we're doing it. And that's how you did it. And you know, and it made them appreciate a little bit about why I felt that way. Yeah. Just to play devil's advocate for a second and give a different point of view. I feel like sometimes it's that need for control that makes us so rigid in the routines that we feel like there are no exceptions allowed. And I learned that sometimes exceptions aren't bad. Now, it's really different, I think, if your family is providing childcare every day, if they're involved all the time, and it's like, yeah, I need to get you on board with sleep because otherwise my baby's not sleeping, and that is obviously essential to their growth and development. But sometimes, like in the case of the TV, and first child, it's so hard in these first few months to get any perspective, right? Well, I'm sure they weren't having Ashley watch television in the first few months, but whenever that was that she was watching television before bed. Um, 
you know, it's, it, it's like something you also come to, to say on the nights you see your grandparents, which is valuable for so many other reasons. And for relationships, you have some rules at grandma's house that don't exist here. Right. And can we live that life where it's like, and again, it depends, I think, the frequency and how egregious the difference is between, I know, co-parents um, who parent in different homes, like this is a real issue because, you know, of course, you can't say like, we don't eat junk food in one house and we eat a ton in the other and we don't watch TV in one house and we watch a ton in the other. That that can be hard. But opening yourself up to the idea that you can't have a limit around everything and that maybe for the benefit of a relationship, some of that stuff you can compromise around. So I would say it has to be both. It has to be the like, I need to explain to you what's important to me, but everything can't be equally important to me because then I think it becomes hard for them to know what to do to help you at all. That's such a good point. Like I was literally just on a call about co-parenting, you know, it's the same idea, someone's same idea. And the woman I was trying to, she's like, you know, it all comes down to, do you love my child or, and are they safe? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they stay up too late every time they're with their grandparents or they, you know, that it also gets confusing with friends. And I'm just going to put this out there, even though we have a young audience, but like, you know, our children start to become attached to their friends and they go to their houses and we can't control everything. And there's, there is room for an important lesson as your kids get older of like, every family has their own rules. Every family does things a different way. This is what's important to me in our house. And some of that they take forward with them in the world. And some of times they learn that that's not true everywhere. Right. And so it goes both ways, but Erica, I feel you is very hard with your routines. The lists I used to make for even my own family members, like for me to be able to go out for dinner, I would be like this, do this, turn that on. I'll check with you 47 times. And that's gotten worse now. Like Aaron, you and I didn't have the level of app trackers and and like spying on them that now exists. Well, you you have that now. I was gonna say, oh, you're younger when you're there. A twenty year old when you're almost fifty. I mean, there's a it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. But like, I thought I was fancy when I could like, you know, get a ten second delay and see if she was crying on a thing. And now it's like the sensors on my phone. I don't know. It feels like it's even gotten more. So like, how do you even ever leave the house and feel you've empowered the people who are taking care of your baby? That's such a good point. I mean, I know we're running out of time, but that is such a good point. Like things have shifted in a way that at least I have felt that you almost feel guilty if you're not on your child all the time, but yet at the same time, that's probably not the best. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's another assembly. <laughs> it is another assembly. And we didn't get, we, one thing we didn't get to talk about that we have three minutes to talk about is like, what about when you're really excited to go to work and get out of the house and do other things? And that goes to that point is that like, how have we gotten to a place where you're not supposed to want time off when obviously you want time off? Everybody wants to, anybody who told you they never want a minute off can't be possibly telling the truth. Just can't be. And it's not fully a minute off, right? Like you are like doing something good for your family and for yourself, which in turn is good for them. Yeah. There's a lot. So much to unpack. So much, so much to unpack. (laughs) Um, Happy mommy, happy baby. Work is mommy time. Totally. Totally. (laughs) Totally agree. I feel like when I start work, like that first half an hour where I just like catch up on like well, I'm doing my inbox again, not Aaron, but like, you know, just getting organized. I'm like, this is the most relaxed I've felt in so long. And yet I'm at work. I don't, it doesn't make any sense, but there is totally, totally that time and separation that you need. I well, remember I, the first moment I went to the office and had coffee and was doing my email after Ashley was born, my older one. And it was like blissful. <laughs> blissful. <laughs> totally, totally blissful. Those are the moments nobody wants to talk about because I don't know, that's there's something wrong with it, but those are the great moments. Yeah. This was so fun. I love hanging out with you and talking about research. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you guys all for joining us. Um, there will be a recorded version of this of all of our recorded assemblies. You can check them all out on the Cooper website if you haven't been there. Um, And 
send us questions, emails, follow-ups, join a COOP group, be in touch. Um, we have office hours every Thursday. You can come with any question. We'd love to see you again. Even though we don't see you, we would love to see you camera on or off um, at a future Cooper thing event. Definitely. And should we give our, I have a new email now that I'm with Cooper that I check. So shall we throw our emails out there so folks can email us if they have questions? Yes. Erin at yourcooper.com. And you wouldn't possibly guess that I'm Marielle at yourcooper.com. <laughs> in case you couldn't tell the theme. And I think everybody will get a follow-up email because you RSVP'd for tonight with more information in the website link and, and all of that. But please don't hesitate to reach out if there's ever a question we can answer or for any future things that we're doing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Sorry for the tech again. And if you want to hang out for a few minutes and ask us questions, feel free. <laughs> oh, that too. <laughs>